Uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning, depending on where you are in the world right now. Um, thanks for taking some time out of your day today to join me. Um, so over the next sort of 35 minutes or so, um, I'm hoping to talk to you a little bit about uh, mentorship and kind of supporting learners and early career developers. Um, and along the way, I'm hoping to kind of share some tips from my own experience, which I think can help you to really kind of um, juice that mentor-mentee relationship in order to have a sort of lasting, uh, meaningful impact on the learners that you work with. Um, so Naomi's already kind of gone over this a little bit, but maybe before I begin, I can just do a very quick detour into my own kind of experience and where I'm coming from, um, just to kind of set context for, for what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so yeah, I've been at 8 Light for about two years, uh, working in software for a little bit short of five. But as Naomi said, prior to that, I was in uh, my sort of professional background was in education. So I was a primary school teacher um, at various points in the past. I've also done sort of music tuition and English as a second language lessons with with learners from sort of toddlers through to retirees. Um, changed career after attending a boot camp here in London, worked as a dev for a bit, went back to that boot camp and worked there as a coach for about 18 months. So supporting learners there. Um, and then I've also done some sort of teaching and mentorship stuff with an organization called Code Your Future, uh, which offers a sort of free boot camp type experience, um, primarily to refugees, uh, but also to members of other sort of um, groups which are underrepresented in the industry. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that over the years, I've had the opportunity to work with like a really diverse range of, of learners across various different educational contexts. So I'm really interested in learning. Um, and I guess I've spent a fair amount of time and effort over the years thinking about how to sort of help learners really juice experiences for all they're worth. Um, because in, in spite of all the different contexts of work across and the different sort of approaches that they require, that's the common aim, right? Uh, we're seeking to sort of uh, make sure that we promote the accumulation and retention of knowledge. And I'm going to keep coming back to that as a sort of baseline uh, definition of learning throughout this talk. Um, so while I think mentorship can be impactful for, for people in, in all kinds of ways, this is kind of what I'm most interested in. And what I talk about when I talk about achieving impact is, is generating the greatest possible learning. And when I talk about that impact being lasting, what I mean is empowering the learners to go on and kind of continue learning even after that mentorship relationship has come to an end. So broadly speaking, I want to divide my talk today into just kind of two parts. The first half is a little bit theoretical. Um, and I want to talk about a theory of learning, which I find really compelling, uh, which I sort of try to use to underpin the things that I do uh, to try and support learners. Um, and then the second half is hopefully a little bit more practical. Um, I'll share some tips that I'm hoping that you'll be able to go away and kind of use in your own practice as you support learners um, in whatever context you're, you're doing that. Um, okay, so our interest here is in maximizing learning, right? So it stands to reason uh, that a good place to start would be to understand what learning actually is. Well, as I previously said, uh, I want to define learning as the accumulation and retention of knowledge. That feels like a reasonably sort of um, uncontroversial place to start, I guess. Um, but then a more interesting question is maybe how does that actually happen? And that's a much more difficult kind of contentious question to answer, I think. Um, so there's a bunch of theoretical models which all sort of seek to explain exactly what happens at a, 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 like a cognitive level when we learn something. Uh, and some of those have a lot of overlap and some of them are in kind of almost diametric opposition to each other really. But the model I tend to find the most sort of compelling um, is called connectivism, uh, which was outlined by this guy here, uh, Dr. George Siemens. He's a, a psychology professor uh, from Canada. Um, and at the most sort of basic level, connectivism models knowledge as a set of sort of interconnected nodes, right? And each of those nodes represents some piece of information that we might sort of encounter and store away in our, in our brains. Um, and then the connections between those nodes represent our understanding of how those pieces of information sort of interrelate and interplay with one another. Now, storing information alone, I don't think qualifies as learning because we can have access to, to all the information in the world 
and still be like the most ignorant person, the least knowledgeable person under the sun, unless we can apply that, that, that knowledge, that information in context, right? So, so what constructivism says, and what I tend to agree with, is that being knowledgeable is essentially a reflection of how we've connected these different pieces of information over some period of time. So learning is therefore like a process of, of forming, then strengthening, or in some cases, realizing that the connections we've made are, are incorrect and then discarding them. Um, and we use those connections to form this kind of mental model of how these different pieces of information are related. And from there, we build our own sort of mental map of the world around us. So connectivism identifies three kind of distinct types of nodes that we're interested in. And the first one is a neural node. So at some level, learning is like a, a biological process, right? So neurons fire between synapses and make connections in our brains. And I don't really understand how this works. I'm sure it's very fascinating stuff if, you're, if your interest is in like neuroscience. But as educators, our ability to affect these sort of fundamentally biological processes is, is probably fairly limited, I think. So the next level up is where our sort of interest starts. Um, and that's an internal node. So this is where we reach this idea of our mental map of how different concepts kind of interrelate. So building these connections over time allows us to kind of expand our model and uh, like our model of understanding by kind of gradually fitting different like nodes together, right? Um, and then there are a bunch of different theories of learning which also share this idea of kind of nodes and connections. But what's where, where kind of connectivism is distinct in that it's, it is in its definition of this third type of node, so the external node. And these represent sort of sources of information that we might go out and choose to learn from. Um, and so what George Siemens said and what he suggested is that in recent years, um, and particularly since the kind of birth of the internet, the pace at which information is, is developed and disseminated has grown at like an exponential rate. And that has sort of two important consequences for us as people who are sort of interested in learning. Um, the first is that the lifespan of information has been drastically reduced. So we kind of supersede what we think we know and replace that with new information at a much faster rate than at any other time in human history. And then the second sort of related consequence is that in a world where we now have so many different potential sources of information, our kind of filters need to be really finely tuned in order to determine which sources of information are kind of worth listening to and which are flawed or outdated or just like outright false. Because as we sort of seem to be seeing more and more in recent years, not all sources of information are created equal, right? And, and focusing on the wrong things can have like genuine and meaningful consequences for us. So this idea of kind of recognizing and selecting useful knowledge as being worth learning um, is increasingly a kind of really important meta skill that has to be applied before any actual learning can take place. So if we follow this model of learning presented by connectivism, then your job as a mentor or a coach or a teacher or as an educator of any kind effectively is, is like twofold. So firstly, you need to try and understand the kind of internal connections that a learner has made uh, and help to foster those useful connections and break any false ones that they've sort of made along the way. And then secondly, you need to be able to empower learners to, to continue building upon their knowledge by facilitating access to appropriate information and developing their ability to find further sources independently. So if that's what we're trying to do in order to sort of make the biggest impact, how do we actually go about doing that? And again, as you might expect, that's not an entirely easy question to answer, right? Education, unfortunately, as a field is full of these sort of really quite weakly evidenced ideas of things that we should do, which will make a difference, which in practice, like may or may not make a difference, but which somehow sort of um, get absorbed into, into sort of educational practice and, and get repeated almost quite dogmatically. Um, but the most sort of scientific body of work that I'm aware of into what actually works to promote learning is by a guy called John Hattie. Um, he's an educationalist from, I think, New Zealand. 
Um, and he's a proponent of what he calls evidence-based teaching. So that's only using strategies which have been like quantitatively proven to be effective in, in supporting learners and improving progress. Um, and in the spirit of that, he produced this book, Visible Learning, which is a, a, a meta-analysis of like over 800 different studies that were conducted in schools around the world, uh, which he uses to produce a sort of ranking of the most impactful sort of actions and behaviors that teachers could perform in terms of, of driving forward their students' progression. And you might say, well, um, what are things which teachers working with groups of you know, seven-year-olds got to do with mentoring an adult who's looking to, to learn or improve their skills as a, a software developer. Like those contexts are completely and radically different. And yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. But I would argue that while certainly the specific actions that you're gonna take are obviously gonna be very different, your aim is still the same, right? Like I said, this accumulation and retention of knowledge. And, and one thing that I've kind of found over the years, having again, like the opportunity to work, as I said, with a bunch of different kinds of learners across different age groups and, and different contexts, is that there seems to be an awful lot more which is in common across those boundaries uh, than, than which is sort of different. And so I think that by taking a sort of broad approach, we can absolutely apply some of these themes that, that Hattie identifies to the kind of learners that we're interested in here. So um, the second part, as I said here, is going to be kind of looking at some of those themes and trying to give some insights into how I think they can be mapped onto this model of learning that Connectivism provides us with, and then how we can apply them to mentoring a, a learner software developer. Um, and then I'll try and draw on some of my own experiences of working at the boot camp and with Code Your Future students and stuff um, to try and outline some practical tips, which I'm hoping that you can go away and, and sort of use yourselves. So there's a couple of sort of broad areas that I want to cover, which Chatty um, identifies as important. And I'm going to split those into two sort of subsections. Um, the first section is going to cover the sort of preparation for a learning experience. So what you should be doing at the outset. And within that, I want to look at the idea of setting goals, uh, setting tasks, um, selecting resources. And another thing which Hattie doesn't really cover so much, but which I think is super important, um, setting context. And then the second group uh, covers kind of things which you can do on an ongoing basis, like throughout a learning experience. And in there, I wanna talk about assessment and feedback. Um, and I think if we can kind of hit all those things, then that kind of uh, covers all our bases, really. So let's maybe start with context. And actually, I recommend that in designing any kind of learning experience, you always start here. Um, so when I was working at Makers, the, the boot camp, I would sometimes try and get in touch with people who I'd worked with there when they started their first job as a developer, just to kind of see how things were going. Um, and, and quite often what I would hear was sort of variations on the theme of I'm really enjoying it. I can do the work I'm being asked to do. So I'm kind of keeping my head above water. So that's good. Um, but I'm really struggling to kind of understand the broader system that I'm working within, like how my work that I'm doing fits into this broader system and therefore like what the value of that work is. So if we kind of go back to this idea of, of connections again, um, really the problem here I think is that their mental map of the system that they were working within that was kind of insufficiently developed. They hadn't yet been able to build up those connections between these disparate pieces of information. And I don't think that's like an uncommon feeling uh, when you're trying to learn any sort of complex new skill, because what I think we're pretty good at as people in general, and particularly if you're choosing to work as a software developer, what I think uh, I'm going to assume you have some sort of uh, uh, aptitude for is sort of drilling down into problems in isolation, kind of breaking those problems up into their constituent parts and, and finding a way through them. We tend to be pretty good at that, I think. What I think most people tend to find an awful lot harder is sort of moving up from a problem and, and determining how that problem fits into the surrounding context. So one of the first things that I would suggest you do when you start like mentoring someone or start sort of planning any sort of learning experience is to do some exercises which kind of um, 
help put learning into context and start building this skill of figuring out the context of a problem. And like the best thing I found for doing this is super simple. It's just diagramming. Um, I think it's hugely, hugely helpful as a tool for learners to explain their own understanding of like the context surrounding a problem, um, as well as sort of exposing themselves to any particular like blind spots that they have. So um, let's say, for example, I am trying to learn about like uh, deploying an application to AWS, right? And I know there's this thing called the VPC, and I'm pretty sure that's really important and it's something I need to know about. And I also know there's this thing called a subnet, and I feel the same way about that. But when it comes to drawing my diagram, I don't know how those things would fit together. I can't like visualize how those things like lay on top of each other. Well, now that's given me a pretty good idea of where I should be like directing my efforts in order to, to grow my understanding, right? So really useful for kind of highlighting blind spots in that way. And then probably the most sort of enlightening diagram exercise that I've done with learners involves going back again to this idea of the internal nodes we talked about earlier. So what I've often done with people is said, okay, here is the topic we're interested in. Let's spend 10 minutes sitting together and I want you to map out everything you think you know about this topic and how it all fits together. So, so maybe you're looking at TDD, let's say. And so you're starting to build up this physical artifact of how all the information the learner currently has at their disposal is kind of connected up in their head. So maybe they say, okay, well, as far as TDD goes, I know that's connected to this idea of red green refactor. So we can connect those two nodes and I'm, I'm pretty confident of that. Um, I also know that it involves writing tests, right? And when I write tests, I'm pretty sure I usually use a testing framework. And here are some frameworks I know about. Um, what else do I know about testing? I've heard this idea that tests should be isolated, but I don't really know what that means. And I can't sort of connect that node further. That's kind of the edge of my understanding right now. And again, you can kind of go as far as you want with this. Um, and again, the purpose here is that the fact that the learner now has this physical artifact of their mental model, which you can kind of discuss and interrogate and which helps the learner to kind of identify their own gaps. And the flip side of this, what this is also really useful for, it has the benefit of really helping you to get a clearer sense of the current state of like a learner's knowledge, right? So you can understand which connections they've made, which they haven't, and sort of highlight any connections which they think exist, which maybe are a little bit sort of uh, off base. And that leads kind of nicely into the other side of what I want to talk about in, in relation to, sex, to establishing context, um, which is to kind of try and make sure that you know where the person you're supporting is coming from and what they're hoping to gain from the relationship. So let them guide your initial conversations um, and try to get a sense of where they're headed, but also bear in mind where they're coming from. Um, we work in an industry which has this real fixation on a distinction between junior and senior, right? But I've worked with learners in the past who've been coming from like really successful careers in, in law, medicine, finance, uh, like education, civil engineering, all sorts of fields where in some cases, these people were charging hundreds of pounds a day for the skills that they were bringing to their organizations. And which and those same skills are things that they're gonna be able to bring to their role as developers too. But because they've decided that they're interested in learning to code, they're suddenly slapped with this like junior label. So be aware of the skills that people are bringing to the table and, and bear in mind that mentorship is like a two-way process. They've probably got things that they can teach you as well. Okay, so moving on to goals. Uh, so Hattie talks a lot about kind of establishing high expectations. And in the context of a school situation, what he means is teachers kind of having high expectations of learners. Um, in a kind of adult situation, I think it's probably more useful to kind of flip that on its head a little bit and try and ensure that the learners you're working with have really high expectations of themselves. Um, and I think a really good process uh, to facilitate this is like explicit goal setting. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about here comes from a guy called Edwin Locke, who wrote this paper called Theory of Goal Setting and Performance. So if you're interested in finding out more about this stuff, that's where to go. Um, but at a high level, he kind of talks about the, 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 like the motivating power of having a clearly defined set of goals that you're working towards. So early in a mentoring relationship, I think a really great thing to do is to ask a learner, so this time, you know, next month, let's say, 
What are three or four things that you're going to be able to say about yourself that you can't say right now? Um, and a good goal needs to be four things. It should be specific, aspirational, expected, and believed. Uh, so they need to be specific enough that they be measured and said to be objectively true. So I'm going to be a really great programmer is probably not a very good goal because it's too broad. And like, by what metric do you determine whether that's happened or not? A much better goal would be something along the lines of like, well, uh, I'm going to be able to reliably perform a red green refactor cycle when building software. You can tell whether that is true or not. Um, there needs to be aspirational. So if the learner feels like they can already achieve the goal, or even if they just think, well, I'm already pretty close, there's not so much value here. Um, it should be the case that it's going to take significant effort to be able to accomplish. And I think your understanding of where the learner already is at, based on the kind of context setting you've already done here, is really important. Uh, if you think that the, the kind of connections formed, uh, the connections required to achieve this goal have already been formed, like push them to be a little bit more ambitious. Um, expected. And so this is where we kind of get to setting your own high expectations a little bit. Um, when a goal is set, you should make it clear that what you really expect is that that goal is going to be met. It's not, well, we're going to try our hardest and, and hopefully we'll get there. It's you're going to put the work in uh, and I'm going to be here to help you uh, to achieve that. And of course, in the event that it doesn't happen, like that's absolutely fine in reality. You certainly want to create a safe space for learners where if things don't quite go to plan, that's not actually a problem. We talk about it. We understand why it happened and we have another go. But a safe space isn't the same thing as a, a space without challenge. So don't be afraid to kind of push a little bit here. And then finally, the kind of flip side of that is that the goals need to be believed. You actually, it's, it's, it's crucial that you believe in the ability of the learner you're working with to achieve the goals they've set themselves. And you make that clear to them as well. Um, I think there are very few things which are more sort of powerfully motivating than, than having someone who genuinely believes in your ability to learn or do something. Um, so again, near the outset of your relationship, have your learner create a sort of short list of goals, keep a record of them and revisit and update them at some sort of like regular interval. OK, moving on to tasks. Um, I think it's really, over, it's really, really easy to overthink this part. Um, sometimes people sort of feel, oh, I've got to build out a whole sort of rigorously detailed curriculum that needs to include, you know, 200 planned exercises and it's going to take me 18 months of my time. Um, like if you already have access to a planned curriculum like we do at 8 Flight, awesome. That's really great. That's a super, super powerful sort of knowledge base that you can draw on. But if you're mentoring in some other context and that, does, context, sorry, uh, and that doesn't exist for you, like don't massively overthink this. Um, frankly, like anything which a learner can do within the domain that they're learning about can be made into a learning exercise. Um, I think there's a couple of really simple, low effort things that you can do to kind of juice a task and get the most out of it. Um, so first of all, simple as possible, ooh, too far, introduce a time constraint. And this can be completely artificial and pretty low stakes, but it's amazing just how much like some degree of time pressure can motivate people and kind of push them through uh, uh, to really focus their minds on the task at hand. Uh, provide minimal unblocking, minimal being the key word here. So don't ever just show them how to do something. Uh, and that's an idea I'm going to come back to in a minute. But do ensure that when something goes wrong, when they come a bit unstuck, some sort of a help is there for them. That kind of helps negate frustration. Um, provide keywords. I think this one is often like really overlooked. Um, our industry involves an awful lot of jargon, which can be really impenetrable to learners. Uh, and we spoke earlier about the idea that being able to kind of locate and select uh, the appropriate information to learn is a really vital skill. But if you don't have the vocabulary in place to allow you to search and identify it, that's gonna be incredibly difficult to do. Um, so when you're setting a task, uh, provide just a couple of key terms and say, you know, you might want to look at X, Y, and Z, uh, and that can be really empowering in terms of just allowing somebody to unblock themselves. And then finally, be encouraging. Like software development is really hard. Um, a bit of encouragement is really, really vital to just keep people pushing through and keep them motivated, I think. Okay, and then finally for this section, resources. Um, again, like a key part of the learning we want to be encouraging and promoting here is this ability to locate resources independently, obviously. 
But all the same, I think it's really important to model what good resources look like and to give us all point by pointing people in the right direction. Um, so some sort of simple tips for selecting resources that you want to share with your learners. Um, so first of all, bear in mind that you are the best resource that the learner you're working with can possibly access. You've got expertise in the field, and much more importantly, you have a personal relationship with that person. So you have a much clearer understanding of exactly what they need than any book or article that you could share with them can ever have. So to whatever extent is like possible and reasonable, make yourself available to the learner. Um, then next, try to keep things focused. Um, I've worked with so many learners in the past who've wanted to kind of spin off into this absolute like mayhem scenario of wanting to learn and understand everything all at once. And a big part of your job is to kind of stop them from doing that. Um, software is way too big and way too complex for that approach to ever work. So keep the resources that you're sharing tightly focused on the learning that's happening like right now. And then finally, and this is like a really important one, I think, try to avoid tutorials. Um, Tutorials are like sort of learning narcotics. They make us feel good. We work through them and they give us this sort of warm, fuzzy sense of achievement that I made something that works. But they tend to hold you kind of so tightly by the hand that the reality is after you've done that tutorial, nine times out of 10, you can't apply that same learning, that same sort of information you've gleaned from that tutorial to any other context without looking at that tutorial again. So you've developed this new information node, but you haven't had any opportunity to build up any connections with other nodes, any actual understanding of what you've just done. And we're dealing with complex problems here. And the only way to really kind of understand a complex problem is to, you know, to, to, to grapple with them and to understand how they actually work. Um, the one caveat I'd add here is that if you get the sense that somebody just like really needs a lift, they're struggling a little bit and they need to see something that they've done working, then and probably only then, I think sharing a tutorial might be okay. Otherwise, like really try to avoid them as much as possible. Okay, so that's the sort of things that I think you should be thinking about at the start of a relationship. Uh, let's move on to things which can kind of happen as the learning experience continues. So let's start with assessment. Um, so, so maybe the type of assessment most of us are sort of most familiar with is the kind where we, that we experienced at like school or university where we set a test at the end of a class or the end of the year. Um, that's what we call summative assessment. And it is of absolutely no learning value to anybody. Um, it's always struck me as completely wrong that we do this kind of assessment and then that, that's it. You score X number of points, well done. Here's a piece of paper. Hope you've done all the learning you need to do because that's it now. Um, like the prevalence of summative assessment is entirely uh, a function of the way our kind of school systems are organized. It has nothing to do with benefit to learners. So like, just don't do it. <laughs> uh, so what we're much more interested in is formative assessment. So that's assessment which occurs as a learning experience progresses and which then kind of informs the future direction of that experience. And the form that this assessment kind of takes is kind of dependent on the content of the learning that's taking place. And I think knowledge and learning can be sort of broken down into four categories, um, concept, concretes, concepts, skills, and behaviors. Um, concretes are basically sort of empirically observable, factual things, right? Um, and in my experience, people who are sort of just starting to learn to code often really want to focus on concrete. They're like easy things to grasp. They get really fixated on learning syntax, for example. Um, and when I was working at the boot camp, if someone came to me and asked like a syntax question, if someone said, how do I write a function in JS? I would basically say, like, I'm not answering that, go away. Um, that wasn't just me being unkind. Um, the fact is the internet can answer that question like way better than I can. And not only that, it can also tell you not just how to write a function in JavaScript, it can tell you how to write a function in any language you like. And kind of being aware of that is way more powerful for a learner, way more empowering 
than having me go, well, you write function and the name and some brackets here, whatever else. So by allowing them to kind of go away and find out for themselves, you're promoting this skill of finding and assessing like external information nodes. So, so concrete's pretty uninteresting, I think. Um, I don't think you'd be worrying about assessing them at all. Concepts are far more interesting. So this would be answering questions like, what is a function? Um, this is something we can probably have a pretty interesting conversation about. They'll learn something. I'll probably learn something too. And then we can go away and take those learnings and apply them to a bunch of different situations in the future. Um, so assessment here, basically really, really low effort. It basically just means talking, like ask the learner where they're at, have them describe their mental model to you. Um, the mind mapping diagram activity that I talked about earlier can also be a really good thing to repeat here to kind of get a sense of the current state of someone's understanding. Um, skills. Skills covers actually doing things, right? So sitting down at the keyboard and being able to write a bunch of functions that interact with each other and provide some functionality. Again, this is obviously really important. Uh, and the best way to assess this is basically sitting down with the learner and doing the pra like practicing the skill in question together. So I think um, pair programming is effectively mandatory uh, when we're working with a learner developer because it means we can sit and focus on building a process which kind of helps to facilitate the skill that we're interested in. And we can then refine that process and work on it until it becomes second nature. And then finally, behaviors. So how do you conduct yourself and approach problems when they arise? So for example, one of the functions you wrote doesn't work. There's a bug in there, but you're not quite sure where it's originating from. So do you have like a proper structured debugging process that you follow? Or do you just sort of panic and flail and change things at random in the hope that you might luck out and make it work? Um, and again, assessment here looks like very much like assessment of skills, sitting with a learner, observing what they do, uh, like modeling useful behaviors. So assessment can be super, super lightweight, just like having conversations and observing learners are probably the most effective tools you have at your disposal in terms of like understanding where they are and continuing to push forward. Um, a couple of final tips here to kind of guide these actions. Always try to ask active questions. So how does X work is a much better question than do you understand X? Because do you understand X opens you up to the answer, yeah, absolutely, yeah, I understand that. And whether that's true or not, it doesn't provide you with any information about their like mental model or the connections that they've been able to make so far. So active questions, much better. And then be Socratic. And this is like a huge topic in itself. But what I mean by it here is effectively try to answer questions with more questions. Um, bear in mind that when a learner comes to you and asks a question, what they want is basically a straight answer. That's going to unblock them. It's going to allow them to move on and they're going to go away happy. Don't give them what they want. And they're going to find this really annoying as a sort of forewarning. People will get annoyed with you when you do this. But by giving a straight answer, what you've effectively done is rob that person of the opportunity to ever go away and find that answer themselves. Like that opportunity is never coming back for that question ever again. So try your best to kind of answer with, question, with, with a new question that makes them think and allows them to kind of recontextualize, reframe the problem, and in the future, ask better questions. This has this kind of cumulative effect over time uh, in terms of their kind of ability to grow their own knowledge and learn more. It's so, so powerful. People will get wound up with you, but it's really worthwhile. Okay, so final area to discuss is feedback. And if we go back to, to Hattie, who we discussed earlier, uh, he found that kind of providing timely, actionable feedback was like among the most important actions that teachers could take uh, in terms of, of improving learner progress. Um, for some learners, though, uh, asking for feedback can be like, it can feel really difficult. Um, for some people, knowing that the work that they've produced isn't perfect, and as a learner, it's not going to be perfect can feel like a real blocker for asking for any feedback at all. So have some sort of framework in place, which makes that an easy thing to do. And that can be like super lightweight. In fact, you're probably already doing it. Like if you're doing PR review, that's a framework for feedback. If you're doing stand-ups and retros, that's a framework for feedback, but just have something in place to make it easy. Um, on the other hand, 
some people kind of over rely on the sense of validation they get from the feedback. They feel pretty overwhelmed by all the new information they're having to learn. And so they want to be kind of told all the time, yeah, you're doing okay, don't worry. Um, in that case, don't be afraid to push back a little. I'd suggest laying a couple of ground rules to kind of um, for seeking feedback effectively. So first of all, demand intentionality. So rather than like a general request for feedback, expect the learner to say exactly what they want feedback on. So is there like a particular pattern they were trying to implement? Um, were they trying to improve their approach to testing? Like be clear about what it is that they want from the feedback. And then once you've established that, keep your feedback tight, like comment on that thing and maybe one or two other things. There's no benefit to overwhelming a learner by sort of commenting on every line of code. And finally, demand iteration, like make it clear that if you're gonna give feedback, your expectation is that the learner is gonna look at that feedback, try to action it, and then like probably come back for some more feedback. Uh, so again, we don't want this to be like a form of summative assessment where here's your feedback and that's it. That's, that's no use to anybody. Okay, so those are the six kind of broad areas which I think are, are useful to think about. So one more time, context, uh, kind of performing activities which sort of introduce this idea of a mental model and connections and help expose those and make the current state of play clear to both the learner and to you. Uh, goals, so setting ambitious targets and that the, the learner wants to achieve. Um, tasks, thinking about the, what the learner will actually do and how they can extract the most benefit from that. Resources, thinking about what you're going to share with the learner to help them complete those tasks. Assessment, thinking about how you can keep on top of the changes in the learner's mental model and use that information to kind of drive learning. And then finally, feedback. So making sure you have the mechanisms in place to let the learner know how they're doing. And I kind of think if you can keep those six broad areas in mind, then you're on top of creating like really positive, worthwhile learning experiences for, for mentees or, or indeed any other learner you're working with. So ultimately, whether you're mentoring or you're teaching or you're coaching or engaging in any other kind of activity as an educator, your responsibility once more is to make sure that learners uh, that you're working with are absorbing, absorbing, I should say, and just as importantly, right, retaining as much knowledge as possible. And furthermore, they're empowered to continue that process even after you stop working together. And if we return kind of one last time to this connectivist model of knowledge, uh, as the connections we kind of form between different pieces of internal and external information. Uh, that means what you're really trying to do is to understand the learner's mental model, help them strengthen the connections that are gonna help them and help them kind of challenge any erroneous connections that you want. Um, and the ideas I've, I've kind of just covered today are things that I've used myself, uh, which I found helpful in, in doing exactly that. Um, and I guess, depending on the context of the mentorship you're offering, some of those might be more sort of useful and applicable than others. But what I'm hoping is that whatever your level of engagement with mentoring, whatever the context you're working in, at least some of them are things that you're able to kind of take away and use yourselves.